A World to Die For by Sam Carson Originally published in Fantastic Universe, July 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell They cut the Markab out of hyperspace three parsecs from Deneb on the North Galactic Polar Course. Three men were aboard the space yacht. The alien ship they expected to find was a thousand times greater. By standards of the Galactic Service, the Markab was on a suicide mission. Rick Guelph, the Markab's pilot, conned sync parallax tapes, the robot master controls, and set the screen charts. In came Captain Rodolph, stout and weary from twenty years of patrol service, Behind was Peer Donald, thin and lithe, with feral eyes and tight lips. I'm tossing out teller screens. If they're breaking out of hyper, as the outposts charted, we won't wait long. You hope, Donald's sardonic voice jeered, your phantom ship paralyzes five ships of the line beyond Altair, so they sent for us to blast it. Captain Rodolph looked the younger man over thoughtfully. You volunteered back at Fleet Base 80. Donald settled to a bench, legs outstretched. Why not? When the brass installs the newest trinogen gun in this dinky yacht, he laughed mirthlessly, one that can blast the ears of a cruiser at a thousand miles. Well, I wanted a crack. Trouble was, he added, I thought we were after a vegan, making a sneak attack. You were told it was a mission beyond the call of duty, Rodolph said sternly. None of the ships meeting the alien had a trinogen battery. We can't carry but one. We've got the fast drive. They figure we can get in one shot and duck. I still say it would make sense to arm a fleet with trinogens, Donald grumbled. If that alien has a transparent ship five miles long, which I gravely doubt on both counts... Rick Guelph or Captain Rodolph could have pointed out that fully two hundred Galactic Service crewmen had seen the ship, that beams passed through it, and only Teller caught its outlines. And there was no doubt of the alien's firepower. It had paralysed electronic systems for hours, leaving the fleet marooned while it moved majestically onward. The Markab was Guelph's, the gift of his mother's family. They had influence and power, enough to provide as fleet a small spacecraft as the galaxy could boast, and to borrow Captain Rodolph from patrol service. There was a reason for all this. Isla Gulf, Rick's father, ranked foremost among explorers, had been lost with his ship, the Perseid, five years before. That was in the Rigel sector and a half-dozen outposts had caught the strange message Isla Guelph had sent before he vanished. Met Crystal Woman. Alien Ship. Am. Teller screens reached out by means of meshed beams. Streaks showed the path of meteors, leaving ghostly streaks. Once, a freighter broke out of hyper, vanished after making a period check. Met Crystal Woman while out of reports by the Galactic Service ships crippled by the great alien visitor, there were two which were responsible for the Markab's presence here, attempting to intercept. Two observers had seen, or thought they had, the titan-like outlines of a woman aboard the ship. Was she the crystal woman? Captain Rodolph thought so. Donald wasn't consulted. He was the gift of Galactic Service, and that organization was curious to know if the Trinogen gun could stand up against the strange but powerful blue beams the alien possessed. Rick Guelph had to know if his father was alive, and there was a chance. For centuries, since Earthmen had left their own solar system and penetrated the galaxy with hyperspace drive, there had been rumors of a giant race, the Titans. The strange, cold, intelligent lifeforms of the Rigelian cluster had their version of Titans, but they seemed afraid, or at least uninterested, in passing information to galactic service. 
Rigelians abhorred Earthmen. They traded, kept diplomatic contacts. Beyond that, they refused all contact. It was in territory of the Rigel Federation that the Elder Guelph had travelled, nearing the end of a five-year charting voyage, and he had said in his last report that bits of information gained along his route bore out reports of a giant ship crossing the galaxy. The Perseid had tried to intercept the visitor. Rick Guelph was acting more on a hunch than on logic. He believed the Perseid was captured, that the aliens, titans or not, came into the galaxy hunting specimens. Maybe it was logical after all. Captain Rodolph was inclined to accept Rick's theory, with reservations. He had agreed to let Rick try his hand at making contact should they meet the alien. But he also told Donald to be ready. Donald was ready. He believed the Trinogen gun, with an area of destruction so great that at extreme range error of one hundred miles was negligible, was master of space warships, and he was eager to try out his belief. On the third day, the robot scanners idling, alarm bells rang suddenly. Rick was in his bunk. He collided with Donald in the corridor, racing to the scanning room. Captain Rodolph came in slowly, breathing hard. He stared, as did Rick and Donald, at the incredible sight. On all screens a ship showed, oval in shape, tremendous in length. Its substance could not be determined for skeleton girders, even machines showed vaguely. And moving slowly on the screen strode a woman in white robes. By the grace of Polaris, Captain Rodolph whispered, it's five miles long if it's a metre. Donald recovered first. She's inside fifty miles. Let's blast, he whirled, headed for the gunnery room. Donald, Rodolph shouted, hold it. For a moment, Donald seemed about to defy orders. Then discipline told. May I remind you, sir, he snapped, that surprise is the element, the factor, if we're attacking. Rodolph didn't answer. He nodded to Rick. Use all frequencies. Challenge in service code. Rick called. The huge ship, moving slowly, disdained to answer. The woman was dimly visible staring their way. Rick drew in a long breath. "'Whoever you are,' he said, "'please acknowledge.' Donald slammed the door of the gunnery room. Even then, Captain Rodolph wasn't prepared for his insubordinate act. Too late, he felt the shudder, the roar of the Trinogen gun. "'The fool!' Rodolph cried. He reached for a switch which cut off power to the gunnery room. But it was too late. As his hand touched the button, a series of crimson patches splashed along the alien ship's hull. For a moment, Guelph believed that the Trinogen gun had made a hit. Then the splashes faded into nothingness, and there stood the ship, hull as semi-transparent as ever. "'We're in for it now!' Rodolph shouted. "'The fool didn't touch her!' The woman stood rigid. Her figure was clearer now. Slowly she moved an arm, and a column of intense brilliant blue shot toward the Markab, and darkness enveloped them. Gravity fled the Markab, tumbling. Guelph caromed into Grodolf. They were moving, but Rick Guelph never knew even that, for his head crashed against the wall, and he blacked out. When he came to, lights were on again. Guelph felt a heaviness as he lifted his body. He saw Captain Rodolph standing, gazing at a row of machines that were gliding into the control room from the passageway. The machines were small, like canisters on struts, with tiny casters beneath them, and each canister had four tentacles. They emitted intense bluish light. Captain Rodolph looked down at Guelph. Take it easy, he said. We've been captured, and these things, he pointed to the machines, are it. Guelph's head ached. He staggered to his feet. Donald, he gasped. They took him away right after opening our lock. 
I don't know why, or why they didn't take us too. A voice, low and compelling, spoke in Rick Guelph's brain. You and Captain Rodolph will quit your ship. I advise you not to resist. Rodolph jumped, and Guelph knew had received the order too. The robots wheeled aside, let them pass. We're in her ship, Rodolph said. She hooked us. Lassoed us is a better word. Here we are. The compartment was awe-inspiring in size. A blue vaulted ceiling rose a thousand feet overhead. From wall to wall was the same distance. The floor beneath them was metallic, not translucent. It appeared as solid as any earth metal. Huge conduits ran to machines that the squat robots were tending. The equipment rose a hundred feet high. Then they saw Donald. He was walking slowly toward a moving runway. Robots stepped on and off the runway as they went about what seemed to be routine matters. At the same calm voice which had spoken soundlessly into their minds now bade them step on the runway. They did so, travelled toward a screen, and threw it into a long dim corridor. And at the end of the corridor stood the crystal woman. She was a giantess, a titan. She sat in a chair, white robe trailing from her shoulders and fully a hundred feet beyond her sandaled feet. And the three men stood like midgets before her, stared, rendered silent with awe as a runway slowed to a full stop. They waited, Donald with legs outspread, defiant, hands on blasters which he carried in holsters. Rodolphe and Guelph were unarmed. Rodolphe folded his arms and tried to give the look of a man unafraid. Guelph wasn't thinking of the woman's size, nor what she represented. Beautiful, raced through his mind, with a beauty which hurts like a sharp, twisting blade. The woman's dark eyes stopped on Guelph. Thank you, she said pleasantly. A shiver ran through Guelph, and he had no time to wonder at her knowledge of his own tongue. Now the woman looked at Donald. She rested an elbow on a knee, cupping her chin. "'Little man,' she asked softly, "'why did you try to destroy the Avel, my ship?' "'You are my enemy,' Donald answered. "'You fired on galactic service ships. "'You destroyed the Perseid and its crew. "'It was my duty to try and down you.' Your galactic service attacked first. When I fled to hyperspace, they followed. When I emerged, they were on all sides. I had no quarrel with them. What do you want? Donald said harshly. This is our galaxy, it. Little men from one planet, and you claim a galaxy? Donald nodded, looked stubborn. You've got us, he admitted. But somehow, sometime, we'll destroy you. Unless, he added, you recognize our authority and confess your trespassing. The woman regarded Donald, and there was a look of sadness in her beautiful eyes. In your minds, you call me a titan, she mused. Perhaps I am. But I am not a race, such as you assume. I am not disputing space with any life form. The Avol is mine, and I have a mission, little men. If your galactic service forbids my travelling where I choose, I am sorry, but nothing your race can do shall stop me. Donald reached for his guns. Rodolph and Guelph acted as one to stop him, but Donald fired straight at the heart of the woman before they could reach him. Nothing happened. That is, nothing happened to the woman. But Donald vanished. And you— the woman addressed Captain Rodolph. You had a different reason for intercepting me. I am a soldier, Rodolph answered. I think you know my reason. I was on no mission of destruction. Only if your Trinogen gun could have matched my weapons, she said dryly. But you withheld your destruction until you were sure. Your markab is undamaged, Captain Rodolph. It will carry you back to your home port. 
and you will find your impetuous gunner in his quarters. Tell your galactic service superiors that I am called Shalon, she added. When I have completed my mission, I shall probably never revisit your galaxy. You may go, Captain Rodolph. Rodolph turned and strode to the runway. Come on, Rick, he called. Rick Guelph stays, the woman said. Rodolph turned, said, He's not like Donald, he— I mean no harm to your friend, Captain. I merely wish to talk with him alone, she smiled slightly. From nowhere a row of squat robots materialised. Gently they thrust Rodolph onto the runway. Rick, he called, I won't leave till she turns you loose. They'll have to kill me to make me go without you. Rick somehow had no fear at all, but this emotional display from Rodolph was warming. Thanks, Rodolph, he said, but I am not afraid. I feel sure no harm will come to me. He turned back to the fascinating creature on the throne-like chair. Rigelians were life-forms, no larger than earthmen. Vagans were smaller. But this titan, she was amazing. Rick Guelph waited. He felt no anger, no sense of antagonism. Rather, he had a sense of relief now that he faced her. The riddle of space beyond the perimeter of the galaxy was beyond his comprehension. But somehow, Rick Guelph knew he stood before a being, not an enemy. I know the question in your mind, the woman who called herself Shellen said softly. You wish news of Isla Guelph, your father. Rick Guelph nodded, feeling excited, trying not to show his feelings. He is well, and with his command, his Perseid I had to destroy. But I built your father another ship. She smiled. He is placed with his new craft and his new assignment. He stared at her, amazement filling him now. Where is he? And what is his new assignment? Why did he desert Galactic? Shedden considered his questions. There was a faraway look in her eyes. Finally, she said, He is so far away that your hyperspace drive cannot reach him. He is beyond the reach of galactic service. Anger gripped Rick suddenly. He took the oath to serve galactic unto death, and my father is no deserter. Shellon regarded him thoughtfully. Your mind tells me that Isla Guelph was your hero and after your mother died both of you were lonely. Would it hurt if I told you he has mated with a woman of my race, that he is now a titan? Rick gasped. It was incredible. Yet Isla Guelph had believed in such a race as the titans. Wherever spacemen met, sooner or later talk of a giant race would crop up. But until the crystal ship had appeared, there had been no real evidence of such a race unless they were Vagans, Rigelians. How could my father become a Titan? he said. Between your world and ours there stands a barrier, she explained. Where the Markhab is docked, there is a barrier which is within my touch, but is your dimension. This side of the barrier, where I am sitting, is our dimension, what you call Titan world. Isla Guelph, she added, decided to come through that barrier. It was his own choice. Rick felt like sitting down. He felt confused. Why should the woman alter the truth? Why, what do you want of men like my father? Of earthmen? She rose to her feet deliberately. The white robe, gossamer despite its tremendous width and length, fell from her shoulders. As the mass of sheen dropped to the floor, the woman let her hair down, a golden shimmering screen about her white body. And as Rick Guelph watched, a great trembling seized him, and he sank weakly to the floor. A dream is without substance, incoherent in pattern. Rick Guelph knew this was no dream, but he felt as helpless now as he would have been in a dream as there came to him a vision. 
a great city, stretching to infinity, grew from the space behind the woman. There were towers of many hues, all connected by runways. There were peaks in the distance, and on either side of a vast plain he saw a stretch of green water, and above it the sky was also green. From a copper disk above the city came light. It was a mammoth sun, but without the hot intensity of Rick's home sun. This was the home of the Titans. There were ships on the water, air vehicles, land machines, people in loose, thin clothing. There was verdure, trees, flowers in gardens surrounding the entire city. And the woman was talking to him through the vision. It was her home, this city. It had the same name as her ship, Avol, and Avol was the centre of Titan culture, with schools, technical institutes, great temples of learning, and no military organisation of any kind. There was no war here, for struggle between the life forms was not necessary. Only from the archives did they know of war. The Titans interfered with no one. When they travelled outside their galaxy, they were prepared to defend themselves, but they did not desire conflict, and only space police kept the vigil. Shalon was telling him this mentally, and Rick understood. For a thousand years there had been a pattern of slowing up in the Titan's time stream. The women remained unchanged, but in comparisons of ability charts which were kept for every individual, the near retrogression of males was discovered. Titan males were healthy and amiable, but with less and less driving force, and as the male drive lessened drastically, a picked group of women left Avol in search of males with the forceful characteristics Titans must regain to stop their drift backwards. Shellen was one of those women. She had left her dimension to seek such a male, but after a century of fruitless search, for the life-form to which Titan and Earthmen belonged was rare, as Rick's galaxy already had learned, she was returning to Titan when they had met the Perseid. Six men, Shellen said to Rick Guelph, were aboard the Perseid. My friend, Berna, was with me when we found her helpless, her pile's miniature sons, and of the six aboard, only Isla Guelph was alive. Rick felt a sudden release from the force which had rendered him so weak. Now he stood erect again, and Shellen was seated again, the robe drawn over her shoulders once more. The atomic piles of the Perseid's drive had overheated. There was no chance to jettison them before the lifeboats fused to their compartments. We had great difficulty in rescuing your father. He was seriously injured. When we knew that we should not be able to treat your father there, we turned our ship back to Avel. She paused. Here we had to change him to our dimension to treat him. When he recovered, he chose to stay a Titan. Shellen smiled. It could be that Berna was the influence that caused him to make that decision. But aside from that, Isla Guelph is doing many things he had longed to do in your galaxy, but was never able to do. Creative things. Titans respect men who create, who add to the betterment of others. Such creativeness is encouraged here. We live in peace on Titan, and Titans do not have any urge to ruthlessness of any sort and our span of life is ten thousand years. Now she paused. Rick Guelph was trembling. If I become a titan, raced through his mind, then he thought of galactic service and his years with it, of the years spent preparing for the service, of men who had spent their lives serving it. He had never seen earth, but many of the men he had served with had been demoted at the whim of some sector director or other political bigwig down there on earth. There was outlawry aplenty there, they knew, and the galaxy service had the job of fighting earth's battles, some of them battles against organised outlaws, and the outlaws were renegade earthmen. 
Spacemen talked of the good old days when the forefathers met other life forms in the galaxy. There was the showdown with Vagans, which lasted five centuries. Galactic service had to have sporadic conflicts, skirmishes, if not battles, in order to expand. Always the service was expanding. The Trinogen gun was developed for colonizing expeditions in hundreds of sectors where life forms had outgunned galactic service in the past. I should like to live the sort of life my father chose, Rick said abruptly. Is it possible for me to become a Titan too? Shellen smiled. You must first tell your Captain Rodolf of your decision. She was studying him, her eyes bright now. After that, she added, I shall be waiting for you at the barrier, here. You know why I want to be a Titan, Rick asked slowly. Hurry, she said softly, and tell Rodolph. Her cheeks were flushed, her face alive. Yes, I know, I know, darling. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Go on, it's completely free. No cost at all.